Hello, I'm Feedy Master Charlie Story, ex England junior international team chess coach, coach of many brilliant chess students, UK national champions, even was slightly involved in a world junior chess champion uh, as being uh, part of her coaching setup. So you're in good hands here, and I'm going to talk, show you how to beat title players. Now, it's a difficult job beating title players especially if you've never defeated one before. I'm going to show you all the tools you need to be able to do that, the thinking processes, and give you the best possible chance of going into battle against players who have a chess title. So I'm going to start off with one of my games. You're going to see quite a few of my games when I was not a title player. And you're going to see some of my recent students' games, which... Uh, they have defeated title players despite being much, much rated lower than them. Now, this game that we're going to look at first is a game between uh, Grandmaster Keith Arkell versus myself at the British Chess Championships. And we're going to see how, in this game, if I win it, I actually qualify for my Feedy Master title. I did, of course, win this game. Uh, it was a tough game. And how do you go about trying to defeat a Grandmaster? when you're not title, which I was not at the time. Well, first of all, you've got to beat strong players in five different ways. Number one, you've got to prepare well. Number two, you've got to beat them in the opening. You've got to beat them in the middle game. You've got to beat them in the end game. You're probably thinking, what else you got to beat them on? You've got to beat them on time management. So there's five rules, five critical rules if you want to actually defeat a grandmaster. You've got to beat them five different ways. <clears throat> so, uh, how can you beat them five different ways? Because they're very skilled. They know all of this. They, they are excellent at preparing. They're excellent in open, middle, and end game and time management. But if you've got all of these five things down, then you're going to give yourself a fair chance of doing it. Okay, so let's look at number one. So I'm playing this Grandmaster Keith Arkell. I know that in most of his games, he's going to play D4. And sure enough, he played this in the game. I responded with G6. He responded with Knight F3, Bishop G7. Now let's talk about the preparation. So the preparation before the game, we all we both knew that Keith is going to play this way. I He knew at the time I was um, a, um, very good at Fianchettos. And at this point in the British Championships, I hadn't actually invented the sniper. As most of you will know, I'm Charlie Story, the creator and inventor and general promoter of the sniper. And the sniper system is G6, Bishop, G7 and C5 against anything, anything. It doesn't matter what White tries to do. So it's not strictly speaking an opening. It's more of an opening system. Now, Keith knew that I was doing these sorts of structures before I actually published my book on the sniper, where it became more universally understood and he was going to try his best to stop me playing c5 on this move and this is part of his preparation and it's very good and he played a very clever move he played b4 in this position so one thing about strong players is you've got to try and get them out of their normal patterns of understanding now even grandmasters if you can get them into situations where they're not uh fully aware of the patterns that or involved in the board in the middle game, you have a great chance of getting some advantage against them. So Keith is also using this strategy against me here. He's playing B4 to stop C5. So the preparation uh, was quite good by Keith. Uh, Keith Hawker, Grandmaster, one of the best Grandmasters in the UK. He, um, he stopped my C5. So now I had to do some thinking. Now, when I was preparing for Keith, I knew he was not just good in the end game, he's brilliant in the end game. I also saw that he's very good in the middle game, but not as brilliant as he is in the end game. So my approach was to try and get as chaotic in middle game as possible. And I thought I should have equal chances against him in a chaotic middle game with black. Now, it's not so easy having a chaotic middle game with black, but that's what I was striving for. Keith will obviously be trying to stop that, just keep a small position advantage. 
I played d6. So you stop my c5, but the sniper isn't just about g6, bishop, g7, and c5 on three moves. It's also trying to strive to get c5 moving to get those familiar patterns, which means I would be more comfortable in them than Keith, having more experience in those sorts of situations. You and bishop b2, really trying to play like anti-sniper approach. I played a5. Uh, he went b5. And finally, I get my c5 structure in. So it's in again there. So I'm very comfortable in these positions. I've played thousands of them. And being familiar as close as possible to your middle game structures, pawn structures and piece structure, as the, what the sniper is, uh, gives you a bit more confidence to avoid obvious tactics which could occur. And chess is very complicated. And there's so many players miss little three move combinations. But if you're familiar with the positions, then you don't miss them so much. So keep develop knight d2. I play knight h6. I want to keep the diagonal open for, for this point. And when you keep the diagonal open like this, it normally means players are out of the theory. So I've achieved my uh, opening goal, which is to get us both out of the boot. It was also Keith's goal. So we're both happy at this point. He plays e4, typically grabbing the center. My castle. He plays c3. I take on d4. Take on d4. And d5. So this is a, an interesting idea that occurs quite a lot in actually in the sniper open system, where sometimes you will play the pawn to d5. And here I'm trying to get the f5 square for the knight. And when he plays e5, this is sometimes called an overextended center because some squares have become weak, specifically f5. I played a surprising move. You shouldn't really touch wing pawns if you haven't developed all of your pieces, but I have an interesting tempo threat of a3, creating some additional chaos in his position. He restricts my queen development. f6 is known as the grenade move in the sniper because it blows up the center. It's uh, one of my favorite moves. It's very powerful even though it looks just one small little move. Uh, there's something I invented called the pizza pawn scale. I'm going, to invent, I'm going to discuss that a bit later, but for now, just know that this is a pizza pawn scale grenade move. Bishop e2, knight f5. So we're starting to get this uh, knight on the rim into the game. Pressure, Rook c1. g5. Now this looks like a really... Bizarre move, and it is. It's it's a double-edged move. Now Keith here, uh, he probably realised I was trying to avoid the end game, which is possible, and he knows he's in a real middle game fight now, where we don't really understand what's going on because we haven't got a lot of pattern recognition going on in this position. So I call this equalising through chaos. So I've equalised against a grandmaster through chaos, and I'm not a title player. Equalizing through chaos is something I really recommend you start doing. And this is one of the reasons I love the sniper. Even though it's not the best theoretical opening, we call it the engines, you get this human chaos, which humans cannot work out. Not even grandmasters. So uh, try and add playing for middle game chaos to your skill set, especially with black. It's actually helped me to win over 170 opens playing this way because you can win with black and you kind of just draw with black too frequently to win opens. H3 was played by Keith, prophylaxis. Keith is excellent at prophylaxis. Prophylaxis just means preventative moves. Very good preventative move from me playing G4, kicking his knight away from the center. I'm trying to get my poorly placed piece developed. We'll talk about poorly placed pieces a bit more in the video. It should be two. Queen b6, starting to catch up on development now. C2. And now the grenade move uh, reaches its fruition. I have now swapped an f pawn for a central pawn. And that is going to give me some advantage in the center later on, because as you can see, I now have two black pawns to one white pawn in the center. So in the long term, I should be better in the center. But look at my king position. It's a bit drafty, and it is a bit drafty. And this is a double-edged chaos position. So mission accomplished for me as an untitled player. My game plan in the opening 
so far been achieved. But to be said, Keith is probably quite happy with that as well. But I was happy that we'd both be happy. Everybody's happy. Let's move on. A3. Uh, slightly chaotic move. This, this comes with tempo. And the bishop goes back to A1. So that takes it away from any other diagonal, but the best diagonal. So it has taken away some of its potential to come to the A3 diagonal or the C1 diagonal. But it is a beautiful diagonal that sits on. Additionally, this A3 pawn. Even at this point, I'm looking at playing rook takes a2. And if I play rook takes a2, I get a significant additional advantage. Now, you might be thinking, rook takes a2, you can't do that. And you're right. But strong players, uh, they are looking at advantages in the end game, even from this position. So my game plan here is to play rook takes a2 and get a bonus. When I get that bonus, I'll get an automatic pass pawn that's so advanced it becomes so dangerous. Pass pawns are super dangerous. So keep an eye on that a2 pawn. There's a long way before the end game, as they say in chess, before the end game, the gods have placed the middle game. And as we know, chess is super complicated. It might seem easy sometimes for engines, but we are not engines. Human beings, we are more than capable of messing all sorts of things up. Keith Castle. Uh, I play knight b6. Rook e1. Now here is a typical example of a chaos move. Normally rooks are developed through the center, down the open files. You know, that's where they normally belong. But here, this rook actually adds some significant chaos attacking factors where I may be able to get a numerical superiority over on king side. If I have a numerical superiority in pieces and points, then attacks become very realistic for working. There's something I've invented called the nine point rule, and I'll discuss the nine point rule with you a bit later, uh, which you'll find fascinating and an easy way to understand if your attack will work or not. Knight goes backwards. Again, something we'll discuss later. It's poorly placed pieces. And here comes my G4 move. My king side is really weak now because it's lacking in pawn cover. However, something also we'll be discussing later is what I call the platinum rule, which is superior team activity compared to the opponent. Now, this platinum rule is the ultimate rule. Uh, and here I have, uh, after pawn takes, rook takes, I have the superior team activity in regards to the king side. This means there is a significant chance of an attack working. So what a bizarre way to play it. We're in a complete state of chaos. None of us are aware of the middle game patterns that are going on here in any depth. So equalization through chaos is going to give me some chances to beat this brilliant end game player in the middle game. Knight h2. Tempo, bringing his piece to support his king a bit better. Rook g6. Now, it doesn't matter what the engine evaluation is in these situations. It's about two human beings playing chess. And one thing about human beings is they don't defend very well compared to engines. It's their worst area. Uh, they just... To defend well takes a lot of skill, calculation, and assessment, which hu most human beings are not capable of. And when I've analyzed a lot of Grandmaster games, and most Grandmaster games, when you compare it with the engines, they just, when they're under difficult defensive pressure, they can't do it. So this is part of your game plan. Get them under some sort of defensive pressure, even if your position's slightly worse. Queen d2. This is a, an attempt by Keith to go into an endgame. And if he goes into this endgame, then maybe my a3 pawn will be too weak at the moment. I play with knight h4, tempo threat with rook takes g2 check. He takes the queens off as suspected. He's now not quite in an endgame. Now we know he's brilliant in the endgame, but this isn't quite an endgame. This is actually a queenless middle game. And uh, there's still plenty of score before we get anywhere near the need for endgame strategy to be generating all sorts of tactics. And one thing I teach my students is they should always search for three move tactics in the end game. You can't be good at end game strategy unless you can find the three move tactics. And there's loads of them. And loads of grandmasters miss these three move end game tactics. Bishop h6. 
8H4, root takes. Now it gets a bit crazy. Now for the purposes of this game, it's just an illustrative game, to whet your appetite of what's coming. I'm just gonna show you uh, quite quickly what happened. Being here cheered. Now this looks very dangerous. It looks like he's got E6 checkmate at first glance, but of course I've got Bishop B2. Now, this was a very complex position where we both had to calculate and assess in a chaos position. And to be honest, I don't think both of us saw everything. Um, I saw a lot, he saw a lot, but there were still some things we were missing. And that's the reality of human play in chaos positions. Of course, if you're used to the positions, you can see almost everything because you pre-analyzed it. So he takes here, and I took check, and take here. He then played this annoying e6 check. It's looking though he might have some sort of nasty checkmate in sequence with his bishop, rook, and knight. Something else I'll discuss with you later is how to prioritize what you should be thinking in the end game if you want to beat title players. So look at this for a moment. Rook b2. So one thing I've learned a lot over the past 10 years is the importance of a pass pawn. And this pass pawn if he takes, becomes really deadly. He takes on b2. He didn't take on b2 yet. He brought his knight in, tempo. King's coming across now. So now I actually have the slightly more active king compared to him. We both know the importance of the king in an endgame. And even though this is an endgame, there's still so much tactical possibilities. Both sides, well, white can come up with ideas to mate black quite easily. Black has to be as a priority on the guard to that, which of course I was. He centralizes his knight, also good in the end game. And finally, I play my rook takes a2, which I mentioned earlier. So even when I played a3 all the way back then, I was thinking about grabbing this pawn. And then I knew when I grabbed it, I would be getting a super bonus with this a3 pass pawn. And we know how dangerous pass pawns are. Keith, for his part, was more concerned for going for my king. But I'd worked all of this out that there was no actual real attack. It looks a bit scary, but the king can just do what the king does when it's under attack and go for a walk to safety. Bishop c3. Knight came to c4. That ear pawn's starting to look dangerous now. Uh, and Keith actually resigned here. And so what have we learned from this game plan? Number There was five things I had to do to secure my feedy monster title. I had to plan well for the game. I had to Plan my opening chaos. When I got into the chaos, I had to come up with a nice plan to try and get superior team activity where we, I was able to attack him. And then I had to outplay him in this end game. And all of that still has to be done within good time management. And time management means good time management. It doesn't mean being ahead on the clock. It means knowing when you should be ahead on the clock and when you shouldn't. And that is quite an art form. It's not easy to explain. I will be attempting to explain it throughout the course of this video. So, welcome to my course on the game plan, how to be title players. I'm Char Feedy Monster Charlie Story, ex-England team coach, creator of the Sniper, and uh, coach to multiple UK national chess champions. So, enjoy me, and join me on this journey, and let's see if we can get you beating some title players. And when you can beat them, Please let me know that you've beaten them if this has been quite helpful.